I want to do a deep dive into estrogen. Estrogen is one of these things that gets a really bad rap, but understanding the small details of estrogen really make a big impact and understanding the role it plays and really how you feel as a guy. So I'm here with Derek, my man from uh, More Plates, More Dates, who is an expert in pretty much all things within this category. So can you kind of give just a general overview of estrogen in the first place? Because it's so demonized all the time. Like what, what is its role? Yeah, a lot of people think that estrogen is a female hormone, but the reality is both men and women rely on it very, very significantly. So it's not just like there used to be this push towards get rid of estrogen, you know, the the whole like soy boy era of, you know, if you have high estrogen equals bad. And it's like, yeah, there are some implications with um, kind of like synthetic estrogen like compounds that could otherwise be um, suppressive on testosterone production. That's definitely a thing. But estrogen itself has very, very significant health supporting properties as well as performance too. And it shouldn't be demonized, which it often is in men specifically. Like I think almost the way testosterone is demonized on the female side to some extent, estrogen very much is on the male side. And they think it's just the antithesis of anything masculinity when in reality, even things like your libido could be supported by estrogen very significantly. Like one thing I've Notice myself, which is like the most wild extreme example, but manually crashing my estrogen when I used to do bodybuilding and, you know, cutting down as aggressively as I could. One of the things I tried to do, and this is a common practice among like physique athletes and stuff, if you can even call it athletes, because you're basically just <laughs> trying to get as shredded as possible. It's not really athletics, but crashing your estrogen on purpose with an aromatase inhibitor to get drier looking. And what happened was when I noticed when my estrogen went not just a single digit, but to like near zero, all of a sudden I became totally apathetic um, about life in general. I was essentially was asexual. I didn't care about uh, <laughs> women at all anymore. The girls I was talking to, I just stopped talking to. And I uh, basically ceased to have a libido in any capacity whatsoever. So, and that my testosterone levels were still high. Like I was on <laughs> synthetic androgens at the time and just the estrogen itself crashing it just like totally nuked my libido entirely. And also had like really bad joint pain, like a bunch of stuff that estrogen supports. So estrogen is super impactful, not just on sexual health, but also neurological health and cardiovascular health. Like there's a reason. And I think some of the best examples of this is what happens to women in menopause they have this spike in neurodegeneration as well as cardiovascular disease and it's partly a consequence of the deprivation of estrogen that happens when they enter the state and when you extrapolate out that to men it is very very applicable and relevant and still has the exact same overlap i want to mention i popped a 30 percent off discount link down below for thrive market now, Thrive Market is an online grocery store, but it's not like a regular grocery store. It's set up by different diet categories. Okay, so you've got keto, you've got vegan, you've got paleo, you've got different diet categories. So it allows you to get the best quality foods, okay, no preservatives, no garbage. You can stock up your whole house, not just your pantry. They have sustainable meat and seafood options, so you can stock up your fridge. They're working on really cool options as well. So you're looking at just everything you can get in a store essentially that's going to be in frozen or in the regular section delivered to your doorstep and with this link you save 30 percent off your entire first grocery order plus a free 50 dollars gift so i've also created my fasting bundle which is things that i recommend people get for breaking their fast and also for sustaining their eating period with the right kind of foods so that link is in the top line of the description right below this video I definitely recommend you check them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, but they have been for like five or six years now. And it is definitely where you want to be going as pretty much your one-stop shop, almost entirely your one-stop shop for what you can get delivered to your doorstep for your intermittent fasting routine. Interesting. So yeah. what are some of the things like that can lead a guy to have low estrogen? Obviously, uh, you know, we have aromatase that's occurring as a result of body fat tissue. So like, mm -hmm. you know, I would imagine if we get very, very lean or you lose weight aggressively outside of, you know, letrozole or an aromatase inhibition effect, like there's probably natural ways where your estrogen gets crushed too low. I mean, do you know of any that, I mean, aside from being lean? Um, like in general, things that are lowering of testosterone are also going to have the downstream same impact on estrogen. Because in general, this is a 
like feedback regulated process, however much testosterone you have, very much will equate to some sort of proportional spitting out of DHT or estrogen. So your body has these metabolites that do different things in the body and the the main two processes people are familiar with when it comes to what happens to testosterone. Does it just stay as testosterone and bind to the androgen receptor and do these things? Or does it also, there's five alpha reductase as an enzyme. A lot of people are, are familiar with finasteride and the effect of five alpha reductase inhibition. But on the estrogen side, there's aromatase and this enzymatic conversion of testosterone to, aro to uh, estrogen or estradiol um, is what facilitates estrogen's effects in the brain and the heart all around the body. And this hormone itself is something that uh, um, typically you're not gonna end up low estrogen environment unless you otherwise had a low testosterone environment too. So a lot of the same foundational principles for diet quality, having enough macronutrients, micronutrient density of the foods that you are eating with that sufficient amount of macronutrients, getting enough fats in, um, having a good exercise regimen, but not you know overworking yourself excessively. Um, high quality sleep, all this stuff has the underpinnings of good, adequate endocrine health, which downstream leads to the estrogen production. Like typically you're not going to have somebody who's just oddly disproportionately low in estrogen unless they have some sort of like manipulation of it through like, like there are certain foods that might inhibit aromatization to some extent, but not to like a significant degree where you're going to end up in a like literally estrogen deprived environment if you had adequate testosterone. So I know some people sometimes take testosterone boosting supplements, which could be problematic because they have aromatase inhibitors that on paper actually boost your test, but then on the backside of that, reduce your estrogen. So it very much looks like a good outcome, mm. but it's just manipulating your hypothalamus pituitary testicular axis by, if you lower your estrogen, your brain is going to think, I need to produce more testosterone to get adequate estrogen levels. So as a consequence of that, you get more testosterone, but it's just basically to fill the void of a deficiency you've self-induced on yourself. So <laughs> in general, from like a natural standpoint, I think it's pretty difficult to end up with low estrogen levels as a man unless you have deficient testosterone to begin with. Like maybe if you're super, super lean, but I think that's likely irrelevant for most people. Yeah, and even even myself being, I mean, I'm, I don't know, six, 7%, like, I mean, my estradiol is still fine within range. It's only uh -huh. if I really push it, you know, like last, uh, the summer, I, I wanted to see how lean I could get. I was speaking at the CrossFit Games. I'm like, I'm just going to try to get as lean as I can. Yeah. And uh, I crashed a lot of stuff. Like, I mean, I got very lean, but I felt like a walking dog turd like i mean it just like was <laughs> yeah. horrible you know yeah. and as uh and yeah and I'm, I'm sure my estradiol was crashed then similar to has it has been other times when i got my uh, my body fat very very low one thing that is interesting about that though is <laughs> with all of these like you know the estrogen like compounds that people might be subjecting themselves in their environment and their lifestyle even if you have an adequate level on a piece of paper in your blood work of estradiol like we don't know for sure how much competition for the estrogen receptor is happening with those synthetic, you know, introductions of random hormones. So it's like, is you, even if you have a number on a piece of paper that looks good, you might still end up in a, I don't know, low estrogen or high estrogen environment based on the actual transcriptional activity from that, like, I don't know, phytoestrogen or some yeah. sort of weird estrogen like compound that is not actual the endogenous hormone you're relying on. So I think there might be some states in which people actually have hormonal deficiencies without actually having it represented in their blood work yep. as well. I don't necessarily know that to be something to really own in on and be like, oh, that's you know definitely why I you know have brain fog. I probably have low tests, but, but the test looks good on a piece of paper. It's you know that's it's a very more nuanced conversation because I don't even know for sure like how impactful the environmental factors are on estrogen receptors and what that downstream will lead to. Like we do know there is interaction in some capacity with some things out there, but that's just something to be considerate of. Is I and perhaps that's more nuanced that we even need to get into and too granular. But I think with the prevalence of at least the estrogen-like compounds, I think there could be receptor competition that could lead to some of those things that could be problematic as well. No, I think that's a very fair hypothesis because I, I know one study offhand that was looking at, because uh, I've talked about like benefits from a microbiome perspective with with flax and I've caught some crap on it because like flax is a pretty heavy phytoestrogenic compound. And uh, my rebuttal to that is to people don't always understand that, like if you take a look at uh, 
breast cancer in men when it's like a dominant because of higher levels of estrogen as well or one of the correlations. Uh, it's been interesting research where they say like actually when flax is added in or some of these phytoestrogens, it actually binds to the receptor mm -hmm. as a weaker form of estrogen than the actual mm. bioavailable estrogen in our body yeah. and actually acts as something that blocks the receptor from the more potent estrogen yeah. hitting the receptor and thereby actually attenuates the negative effect. So it's, it's actually quite interesting how sometimes in unique cases, phytoestrogens can actually be a benefit. And the reason I mentioned that is because yes, they absolutely will occupy. And on paper, it might look like your estrogen is higher or lower or whatever, but it's sort of a false positive slash negative. You don't yeah. really know unless you're very super in tune with your diet and know I'm purposely eating a bunch of phytoestrogens right now to test this, which mm -hmm. I don't know why anyone would do that. But yeah. um, so it's like super interesting. And like in that same vein, like people look at estrogen and they don't realize that estrogen is metabolized and that if we have proper methylation, if we have the liver working properly, if the microbiome is working properly, you can process and excrete the, you know, 1,6-hydroxyestradiol and some mm. of the other ones that are more toxic versus the ones that are, what is it, the, uh, is it the 2H estradiol? I don't know. There's, there's two or three, but it's uh, being able to metabolize that is a different set of questions altogether, right? If your estrogen levels are high and you have a higher or better lifestyle, like you're able to metabolize the negative attributes of said estrogen and retain the E2, right? Yeah. So. No, yeah. I think the main thing to take away from, like the most relevant subsect of individuals this would apply to, I think personally, it, like if everything is dialed in from a lifestyle diet perspective, the only people I have to really worry about low estrogen, in my opinion, are the guys who are haphazardly put on aromatase inhibitors with their testosterone replacement, because mm -hmm. that's still a very very prevalent thing. Some people even get their testosterone prescriptions. They'll have a vial of testosterone and they'll have Arimidex by the compounding pharmacy compounded into the test. So like your pre, whatever dose of test you have, you have some amount of aromatase inhibition that you literally are subject to regardless if you want it or not to get your testosterone into your system, which is wild to me. Interesting. Because if you need to manipulate your, your level, your testosterone level any which way, you're subject to that same degree of increasing or decreasing aromatase inhibition. And in general, you shouldn't even have an aromatase inhibitor in there to begin with. Like you should be able to only use it in like the worst case scenario if warranted. But oftentimes I think people don't need it and they end up screwing themselves up by get, putting themselves in a low estrogen environment. And that's um, something I've seen prevalently on my channel is guys that thought they needed Arimidex or whatever it is to have a healthy balance of testosterone to estrogen when in reality they just needed to be like a metabolically fit healthy good diet individual who is administering their testosterone at a therapeutic dose frequently enough to be more representative of what they would naturally because again testosterone is follows a pulsatile like diurnal rhythm it's not something that is just you shoot at once a week and you know your testes don't shoot up tests like once a week and that's you know it <laughs> and you're going to sustain that for a week that's not how it works so people who are typically following the more i would say cutting edge on manipulating administration frequency to be actually representative of what they would sort of naturally do or as close to natural production otherwise those guys end up with less giant fluctuations in hormones and as a consequence or as a benefit of that they don't encounter a lot of the high estrogen side effects that they might otherwise then need to introduce that aromatase inhibitor to counteract. So I think a lot of people are just haphazardly on aromatase inhibitors pretty much is the takeaway. Or I mean, there's kind of a common theme out there that like estrogen is going to make you puffy and retain water. So yeah. I think guys that are, you know, on gear or even go on TRT and doctors that don't necessarily know exactly what they're doing, you know, mm -hmm. they say, well, I don't, oh, hey, like, I, you know, I'm gaining all this weight or I'm feeling puffy or whatever. So they just throw them on a, you know, aromatase inhibitor when that's yeah. not exactly it's kind of a haphazard way of doing it because you're talking like you basically are putting yourself at a fixed ratio rather than a flexible ratio that your body would dictate based upon where your test levels are at. Yeah. No, I've seen like pretty bad neurotoxicity studies where it's like the same dose of testosterone with and without an astrozole, which is a Remedex, and it's just like perfectly fine function and then like brain toxicity. Like yeah, literally like right between the two. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I think there's just a lot of stigma surrounding estrogen in the first place. I mean, it is somewhat of a neuroprotective. It is somewhat of a, you know, a joint protection. It's also what gives you a sense of well-being in a lot of ways. And vasodilates too. Yeah. So if you're getting older and cardiovascular health gets impeded significantly with low estrogen. And ED. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, so exactly. it's uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's a, a common just misconception that I think I just really wanted to address. And it makes people, again, if it is one of those things where your estrogen is like disproportionately high, 
you know, then there's things that you can look at. Yes, disproportionately high estrogen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that can cause a problem if testosterone is low in addition to that. But I think there's a lot of different ways that you can go about handling that prior to, you know, like just jumping on some, you know, Arimidex or something like that. I think yeah. estrogen is one of those things where it can be somewhat manipulated dietarily. It can be somewhat manipulated through exercise. But, you know, it's a good one to cover up. And uh, Derek, as always, man. Yeah, thanks for having me.